Hello, welcome to Great Gardens. We're in Hollison, Massachusetts at Pat Farms. It's the middle of winter and we're going to talk about pruning, specifically pruning blueberries and apples. And uh, we'll show you just how easy it is or how hard it is to maintain these, uh, these very popular New England uh, crops. So let's go see Henry Pat. <laughs> Henry, we picked a beautiful day to be out here. We're here with Henry Pat at Pat Farm in Holliston. Henry's owned this farm for how many years? Well, it's my wife and I. We've, we've moved here in 69. We started you know, clearing some of the land across the street and planting blueberries in 69. So we've been in the blueberry business since 1969. And it's a beautiful farm, about four acres of blueberry crops where we're standing on this beautiful day. We got lucky, no wind, 33 degrees, a little above freezing. Yeah. And as you can see, quite a bit of snow on the ground. But this farm has been a U-Pick operation for quite a few years. I've been here with my family and uh, you uh -huh. do a great job, Henry. Yeah. Today we're gonna talk about uh, how to prune fruit trees in general. We're going to start with the blueberry and then we're going to go see some uh, some other fruit trees as well. So with the blueberry, Henry, obviously you spend a lot of time out here pruning. You've yeah. got your favorite pruning tools with you. Yeah, this is my loppers. I use this here. Um, there's two tools. Um, in pruning blueberries, you generally want to take out one for every six older canes. Okay. The, the reason for that is you want to invigorate the plant to produce new canes. Um, this one here is a four-year-old cane, but as you notice, there's only a couple of real small ones down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take out two of the older canes here, and I like the loppers. If you have a lot of snow like we have here, um, as you see here, it, it, it's made pruning very tough this year so that the loppers would work a lot better. Right, and I can see you shoveled out around here in preparation for the show. Right. And some of these plants are not ready to be pruned because the snow's still too deep, and we're in uh, the end of February here. Right, and actually this is the, the worst year for pruning we've ever had winter-wise. Yeah. Um, people have apple trees getting out there, the snow sometimes three feet tall. Right. It's almost how impossible. Late, how late can you go before you prune in the winter? Actually, you can prune up to your leaf buds coming out. Oh, even into April, yeah, mid-April? Yeah, you can prune right up into April. Okay, yeah. okay. The, the sap hasn't come up too much, so you, you have the opportunity of pruning, and you'll have the cuts healing quicker. So it works Griffin is the good. healthiest dog I've ever met, because Griffin yeah. has a steady diet of blueberries and apples, right? Griffin, back, <laughs> back, good boy. All right. So I'll, I'll take out this one here, and again, I'll use a lopper. And as you see, you know, if you look at the branch here, or, or the, the trunk here, you've got a lot of bumps on it. Each one of these bumps is an indication of, of each year that it's been pruned. Okay. So you've got probably, uh, this is four, five, six, seven, eight, you've got nine, 10, 11. You've got maybe 11, 12 year old cane here. You can see here, you've got some dead branches. Um, Usually, I would just break them off on the ones that I am keeping. Mm -hmm. um, these fatter buds, these are your blueberry flowers. Mm -hmm. And generally, uh, you're going to produce about five to eight blueberries from each one of these large buds. So let's go over it. Every bud is a flower eventually, and every well, flower... Well, it's, it's five to eight flowers. Five to eight flowers, and every right. flower, individual one, produces a how blueberry. many? A blueberry. One blueberry. Right. Okay. And as you can see, there's a lot on here. so. Uh, in the growing season, you'll have branches loaded going right down to the ground. Right. So it's really phenomenal the amount of production you get uh, once they get going. So this is um, one that I'm taking out. There's another one on the other side. And the problem here is I have so many canes here close together that I have to use my other tool, which is a, a folding saw. And, and I love it because I just pop it out just put my latch on it. Mm -hmm. and then I'll go down here and I can get in here where I can't get in with the loppers too good. I'll get in here with my saw here. And now you can see it didn't take very long. Right. And now if you look closely at this one, this is definitely an old one. You have a lot of dead wood from last year. Right. This is where blueberries were on these dead, dead little branches. Yeah. And what you're doing here is you're rejuvenating the plant 
by taking out another older older cane here. Okay. And uh, now Griff, you, uh, you Griffin counted, likes to chase them. Griffin, go, go get, get it, it Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> and you so. counted about nine old canes, and you say take one or two out for every six. Uh, one for every six. One so you took two six. out. You were a little aggressive here. Right, and again, that's because I don't have much in the line of new canes coming up. Okay, okay. Now, the other thing I do after I've done that step, I go into what I call my detail pruning. And on your detailed pruning, uh, again, I, I wear gloves. Over the years, I've noticed my, my next to the last finger, sometimes I'd have like little cuts mm -hmm. on the gloves. So you, you really have to wear gloves when you're out pruning. Okay. And like here, these are long vegetative branches right here. These smaller ones are the ones that are the fruiting branches. They're going to have your blueberries. So I generally cut these in half. So you have some branches with leaves on it. So the straighter the branch, it's more vegetative, less fruit. Right. Are they called suckers? Some people call um, them suckers. When you're I can into see another one here. Yeah, when you're into like apple trees, pear trees, peach mm -hmm. trees, they would be water sprouts. Okay. Uh, your suckers generally come out around the base of your fruit trees. Right. Uh, these generally would be called water sprouts if they were an apple tree. But you can see you got like two feet of growth. Phenomenal. You got no side branches coming off. Why does the plant do that? Um, the area nearest the sun grows the most. Okay. Plants love the sun. That's mm -hmm. where they get the photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the the top portion of all plants will always grow more than uh, your side area. So quite often you're pruning in the middle where the top part is. Right. You're pruning off those those water spots. Yeah, like here. I'm just going to go right across. And again, I'm I'm cutting them like half. Uh, Two thirds down, like here. There's there's no flower buds. Well, there's two here, but I want to invigorate a little more. Here's another one here, and by doing this, I'm going to have good production this year, and next year I'll have more fruiting branches that are okay. going to produce. Okay, and they'll look more like these branches right here. Right. Okay. And the other thing you want to do is once you've Cut those. You have like dead branches. You can go in with your gloves and break off these dead branches. And the reason for that is you're just getting rid of potential homes if a leaf goes up against the branch. Uh, home for bugs and diseases. You want to create some airspace. You want to right. make it so the moisture doesn't get trapped in there, correct? Right. right. And the other thing about blueberries is uh, we all know that all fruit has weight to it. Mm -hmm. When you have blueberries on a branch, it opens up the bush. Right. So right. the branches go right down to the ground, right. loaded with blueberries. Right. I, I find it interesting because as the season goes along, you can see as the bush gets picked, yeah, you know, the branches comes start come, right. starts coming back up. So this is the healthy way to prune, creates more airspace, less moisture gets locked in. Right. Now, you still have some disease issues if you're raising blueberry crop. Crops. Touch upon that real quickly. You mentioned one to me yeah, earlier. Yeah, one, one big problem is called mummy disease. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is um, a mummified berry drops to the ground, and in the spring, when the snow's all gone and the ground is wet and damp, they'll form like little mushrooms that will come out of the mummified berry. There's like two or three little mushrooms. Okay. And there's millions of spores inside that float through the air the time the blueberries. Uh, starting to flower. Okay. And if a spore gets inside the blueberry flower, mm -hmm. it starts an abortion process on the blueberry. Okay. The, the blueberry will turn green when it's supposed to turn blue, usually the end of June into July. It, it aborts and turns a pink color and drops down to the ground. Okay, so it's and a fungicide that you need to, to treat that? Um, or is it an Yeah, you have to spray with a fungicide to okay. treat that. Usually you do it before the flowers even open up. Okay. And okay. it has a kickback action. All right. Um, the other thing you have sometimes is called the on the bug side of it is a blueberry fly maggot. Okay. And um, generally, if you spray just before the blueberries start turning blue, okay, uh, you'll you'll catch the adult okay. um, blueberry fly maggot. Well, very good. This was a good round, well-rounded uh, overview of of how to handle a blueberry bush for your backyard, front yard, whatever the case may be. We're uh -huh. going to go talk about some other fruit trees in a minute, but before we do, we're going to go visit Ann and talk about some other winter insects. Hi, I want to 
wanted to talk to you a little bit about winter moth. Uh, last time we talked about hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, an unusual insect in being active during the winter. Well, here's another one. So when you're out looking at your uh, spring pruning chores or your late winter pruning chores, uh, you should probably also keep this in the back of your mind for something to be on the watch for, especially if you had winter moth damage last year, then you will most certainly have it again this year. Uh, winter moth, the adults, are actually active in November and December, hence their name. You may have seen them fluttering around your outdoor lights. Uh, this is the time when these adults are mating and the females are laying eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch in March, uh, depending on the weather, or maybe early April. And they're going to hatch out as little, truly tiny green caterpillars. These caterpillars are so tiny that they can weasel their way beneath bud scales and into flower and leaf buds just as those buds are beginning to swell. Those, leaves, those bud scales open just enough for them to wriggle their ways in and they can hollow that bud out completely. So that's one level of damage they do. Unfortunately, as adults in the winter and as these teeniest of caterpillars because they get the protection of those bud scales, they're very difficult to control in those stages. But prime time to hit them is what you're going to be looking for and what you're going to be ready for. And that's around uh, the end of April and into May. And that's when they've already done their damage inside those buds. And now they're out and they're free feeders, meaning that they're out on leaf surfaces and eating. And they'll start small, maybe about an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, and they'll eventually end up a good inch long. They're green. They're like an inchworm. They have parallel white stripes, very faint down the back. They also can spindle down on threads. That's called ballooning. It's one way that they can get around. So when they are actually accessible with a spray, so when those caterpillars are now free feeding, when they're very, very small, they're their most vulnerable. You can use products like Bacillus thuringiensis, Kirstaki. That's B-T-K. The K part is very important because it's that strain of B-T that works the best for these caterpillars. And the smaller those caterpillars are, the better. So that's a biological control. That's a bacterium that actually goes after those caterpillars, sickens them, and they stop eating almost immediately. Second one, spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. This is a biorational that's actually made from previously infected um, uh, insects. And that sprayed on an insect on a caterpillar for the winter moth will sicken it again, make it stop eating. Again, when they're smallest, they're the most vulnerable. As they get bigger, it takes them a little longer to die, uh, and they can uh, uh, actually do some damage uh, as they're sickening. Once they get big, if you haven't noticed and you're already seeing a lot of sort of Swiss cheese leaves, then you're talking about using uh, pyrethroid, something like that. Um, pyrethroids, depending on the product you use and the weather you use it in, are actually fairly short-lived pesticides do a quick knockdown, and so they can be very effective. Uh, the caveats on all of these, use them early to get the best effect. Caveat on spinosad in particular, don't use it around active bees. It's quite toxic to them, but it's otherwise a very sensible pesticide approach. So what should you be watching for? You should be watching for tiny little green caterpillars, maybe on long threads. Basically their target trees are maple, oak, apple, crab apple, ash, uh, they can get on blueberries and roses. They will go on other trees as well. Uh, not so much on magnolias or on uh, dogwoods. For some reason, they don't seem to go for those. Um, because most of the times people notice these on significant trees in their landscape, significant meaning big, you'll probably want to get professional help. And this is a case in which I think you really should go there first. So if you think you're going to have a problem, call a tree service now. Set it up. Um, if you want more information about this, Best place to go, umassgreeninfo.org. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. Thank you once again for that great advice. We're going to move on to talk to Henry about apple trees in just a minute. Real quick on the blueberry, what I got out of that is it's not a lot of work to maintain your crop, and boy, is it worth it. Each of those mature blueberry uh, bushes produces about 10 to 20 pints of blueberry, depending on the variety and the size of the berry. So anyway, now we're going to talk about something that's a lot of work, right, Henry? This oh, is yeah. an apple tree. <laughs> yeah, this is a at us. mature apple tree. We probably have had this since, let's say, 1971. Okay. And you can see the size of the trunk. It's got some age on it. Um, 
All these shoots going up, we basically call them water spouts. Uh, there's no flowers on them. Generally, it's all vegetative leaves and branches. And you don't need them all. So generally, you cut those off so you have good air drainage. And the reason you want to have good air drainage, it cuts down on the amount of diseases you can have. It also cuts down on places where bugs can make homes in. Right. And uh, you, you really have to prune during the winter months. Is this tree right here, Henry, is are all these water sprouts just from last year? Just from last year. That's an incredible amount of growth for one year. Yeah, but th this is typical on, on any orchard. You're going to have all these water sprouts because they've been pruned heavy to increase your, your flowering on the branches. Right. So every it, winter, again, before yeah. the middle of April being the latest date, yeah. you have to get out and this is a lot of work. I mean, how much, how long? you estimate to prune each tree? Uh, well, me, um, this winter is tougher than most winters with the snow on the ground and moving the ladder around. Mm -hmm. um, you could be, in, I'd say, close to half an hour or three quarters of an hour. Oh, you're pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, some people, it, it might take, say, two hours. Okay. But unlike the blueberry, you're not pruning, pruning from the base up. You're no. dealing mostly with these, these water sprouts. Right. You're taking off all the water sprouts and um, you're know, watching for any branches that cross each other. This is one that got away from me over the years. It's actually grown into this other branch, mm -hmm. and I've got to take that one out. Um, basically, on pruning, um, the simplest way I can make it is if you can prune a tree so a small bird can fly through the branching, right. you've done a good job. Okay. Uh, because what happens now is sunlight can get in, more photosynthesis, you cut down on places where disease can start in, also where bugs can create a home. Right. And again here, this is the beginning of what I would do. I would go in and look for branches across each other. Uh, generally on bigger branches you want to do a little bit of a cut underneath so that when you cut it off it's not going to peel on you. See, it's a clean cut and because it's clean you're not tearing off the bark and making more healing take place. Right. Um, here this is the large water spout. Again I can use my little saw. It takes a little more time. Um, it's a lot quicker though if you got a regular hand pruner and this is what I have right here. Okay. Um, Felco, yeah. Yeah. This has got a, like a swivel handle. I, I like it because if you're doing a lot of pruning it puts a lot of the action here and not in your wrist. Right. So if people have carpal tunnel syndromes they might think about this pair of pruners. Okay. Um, but you can go along pretty fast and take these right out. What is the most that you would cut off in terms of the, uh, the total branching? Is it a third at the most again, as usual? Yeah, on, on fruit trees, they generally recommend not taking off more than a third of the, the growth. Okay. And the reason for that is you don't want to make the tree too weak. Now, if you cut off too much, you're going to make the tree weaker. There's a lot more cuts to heal. and you want to keep the tree ha healthy as possible. Right. And you're nowhere near a third because you're not taking off these big heavy branches. You're just talking about right. the new, and like new growth. This, this here is a branch crossing another branch. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd take that one right off. This one here is kind of congested. So I'll pull that one out. This okay. is a long and leggy. There's no flower buds on here, vegetative. So I'm cutting that back. Now, where will you expect to see the fruit when you cut something like that back? Would you see it along the stem here this year? No, there's no fruit on here. Okay. It's at the very end here, that big bump there, that's, that's your flower. Okay. There's another big bump here, that's another flower. You might have two or three apples. So you want to minimize the amount of flower buds that you cut off. Right. Because each flower bud turns into one one apple. apple or two apples. And with apples, it's important to remember that you do, you do need different varieties to, right. to pollinate. I right. have Red Delicious. I have Macintosh. This one here in back of you is a Yellow Delicious. Okay. So I, I have good pollination, but as you can see here, once you take the water sprouts off, you, you're getting more of that canopy look. Uh, you, you can prune two ways. This way here is kind of an, an umbrella, 
And what you're doing, you're opening the tree up so the sun gets into the whole tree. Right, and also the fruit can lay down a little lower if you keep topping it yes. like that, right? Yeah. The other way is you can stay with a, a single trunk, go up and have branches come off of that. A trellis pattern of some sort? Well, you can do a trellis, but that's generally more time consuming. Right. But the idea is to get it so that you have good air drainage, sun coming in, and usually you end up having pretty good production but sometimes if you forget it, you know, you're not going to have a lot of production because if this vegetative growth stayed on one season, you'll find the next year your, your fruit production is going to be half. Okay. So you really have to prune. If you're raising fruits, you have to right. prune each year. So again, a lot of work. It's a commitment. People have to know about it. Yeah. And the other reason uh, apple trees can be a lot of work is because they are more prone to some diseases. Why don't you oh, talk yeah. about you, that? Oh, yeah. You've got three bugs. One is the plum cucuyo. That, that bug starts in as the petals drop off. That bug is starting to lay eggs inside the, the little mm -hmm. apple that's forming. This is, this is in the what early, time early spring. Early spring. What's it called? Plum cucuyo. Plum cacilio. Yeah. Okay. And then the the other one is called a coddling moth. That's usually June into uh, August, and that's a little gray moth. So these bugs are at different times of the year, and then you also have the apple fly maggot, which is usually the end of July into August. Now, just because the bugs are out there, don't mean that they're in your yard. You might not have any one of these. Right, right. It's just something you you learn as you go along. Are you doing some preventative spraying every um, year for these things? Yeah, you can. Um, they also have it's a red sphere. You coat it with tanglefoot, hang it on the tree. Um, the fly maggot and sometimes the calling moth are attracted to that and if you look closely on the tangle foot covering on the red sphere right. you'll see the the little apple fly maggots or okay. the calling I've moth. seen those hanging all over trees so people use yeah. a lot of those yeah some people use it to see if they're there and some people if they don't have too many fruit trees they'll right. put two or three of them and that's the control right and what about the tree in general? When it gets this old and looks kind of old and knotty and gnarly and gangly, is it, is, it, is it necessarily unhealthy or that's just the way it looks when you look at the ends of these big old branches here? Well, some of these uh, have been taken off um, to make the branch not too far out. Uh -huh. uh, if you get a heavy snow load in the winter, that's when you lose your branches to you know, storm, snow and ice storms. Right, right. So I tend to take the branches in a little bit once I kind of look at the branch to say, well, you know, that should be able to support a good weight of snow. Yeah, yeah. But uh, by taking it back, you are now encourage a lot of these other branches, which eventually will produce your, your flowers. There's a flower mm -hmm. on this one here. Mm -hmm. There's another flower here. Mm -hmm. So some of these branches, which uh, are two or three years old, have produced these laterals, which okay. have your flowers. Okay. And this is probably a good example of a semi-dwarf height, right? Where it's about yeah, usually, 10, 12 usually feet Yeah, usually 10 to 12 feet. And that's what's popular these days, so people, again, can reach up and pick yeah, the fruit yeah, from uh, the ground. Some orchards, they might want to run their trees about 18, 20 feet. Okay. If they have the tractors and the lifts and, you know, the tall right. <laughs> apple ladders. But, and uh, how much fruit will you expect on a good year from an apple tree that's mature uh, like something this? Something like this, you probably could get, like, maybe two to four bushels of apples. Two to four bushels, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Henry, you got some fro frozen blueberries here. Yeah, these these are the nice fruit we've picked this last year, and a big berry. What kind is this? Uh, it's it's probably Spartan. S P A R T A N is the variety. It has a nice flavor. It's early in the season, and actually, the the blueberry bush that we pruned uh, across the street is Spartan. Spartan. Okay, so, so it's a big berry and it's an early season berry yes. which is important to distinguish early mid late right small medium large with the berries yeah and uh, a blueberry bush you only have two to three weeks the first berry you pick and the last one you pick and the bush is all done for the season so if you're going to do blueberries you might want to do an early season a mid season or a late. late season okay and my kids love these uh they used to throw them in the microwave and, and eat them yeah uh, as they were thawing and they have a nice flavor in the winter actually not bad frozen yeah well the flavor's still there yeah, it sure is. Yeah. And this is the Massachusetts Cultivated Blueberry Growers Association cookbook. Yes. 
some great recipes. Yeah, we, we did that um, because we know that people like to find ways of using blueberries. and we I thought, just saw a blueberry oatmeal cookie. I think I want to go home and make that. <laughs> but this uh, Cultivated Blueberry Growers Association probably has a website, and you can find your local UPIC blueberry operation, which there are dozens of all around the state of Massachusetts, yes, right? Yeah, they are in there. Yeah. All right, and the other last thing we'll talk about is jam. Yeah, this happens to be raspberry jam. Mm -hmm. We we have a few raspberries. We also have blueberry jam, but mm -hmm. uh, I like the small fruits. I like blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries. Right. So. Well, I, it must be contagious. Once you start with blueberries, you must keep going, right? Oh yeah. No, <laughs> it's uh, the homemade jam is wonderful. So we enjoy it. All right. Well, Henry, thank you very much today. We learned a lot. I think this is something that a lot of people can uh, relate to and, and actually do and do successfully uh -huh. in their own yard. So thanks for all your time, Henry. Uh, you're welcome, Peter. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well, who would have thought blueberries in the middle of winter can be so good? Mmm. I want to thank Henry Pat today for inviting us out. Thank you, Ian Wells. If you have any questions about topics that you want to see us cover on future shows, send us an email. And we'll see you next time. I'm Dr. Barbara Herbert. And I'm Dr. Daniel Alford. Prescription drug abuse is a serious problem throughout the United States. The National Institutes of Health estimates that 20% of Americans have used prescription drugs for non-medical reasons. Prescriptions such as painkillers, sedatives, and steroids are among the most commonly abused drugs behind marijuana and ahead of such illicit drugs as cocaine and heroin. The elderly are vulnerable because they take so many prescriptions, and abuse by young people is reaching alarming proportions. Nearly 2 million 12 to 17-year-olds are abusing these drugs. Most people take prescription drugs responsibly. These provide effective therapies for serious conditions, but when used incorrectly, these drugs can become addictive. If you're taking prescription medications or care for someone who does, talk with your physician or pharmacist and make sure you understand how to use them properly. And be sure to keep them stored in a safe place and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. For more information, visit SAMHSA.gov.